Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Heather Hansen. This is the Law and Crime Network, and we have got a lot going on here for you today. We want to start by talking once again about Robert Kraft. You know, I'm from Foxborough, grew up in the backyard of where the Patriots play, so this is a story that my family is watching closely. There you see Robert Kraft on the screen. He is accused of engaging in prostitution, sexual acts with some prostitutes. We have been talking a lot about whether or not the tape of those acts is going to be made public, and there's been a lot of legal wrangling on that topic. Well, today, one of the women that he engaged in those acts with, or allegedly did, you see her there on the screen. She's 59 year old. She has been charged with prostitution, and today she was given the charge and the terms for bail. Uh, those terms for bail were such that she probably will not be getting out. I want to bring in my guest for this afternoon, Matthew Mangino. He is a criminal defense attorney. Matt, you know, this woman, 59 years old, uh, charged with prostitution, what are your thoughts on what the ultimate outcome will be for her? We've talked so much about the outcome for Kraft and not so much on the other men involved or the women. What do you think will happen to the women involved in this alleged sex ring? I think it's an interesting development that they arrested um, this woman because, you know, originally when we heard about this case, you know, there was talk of human trafficking and, and that uh, these uh, sex workers are victims as well uh, and, and that this is a widespread, expansive investigation. You know, now we're at the point where, uh, you know, Robert Kraft has been charged and now the, the woman that he uh, allegedly engaged in sexual acts with and paid for those has also been charged. So it's, it, it kind of changes the dynamics uh, of this case to a certain extent. You know, we're talking about both individuals here being perpetrators. Right. Uh, and that, uh, you know, this, this human trafficking uh, idea has gone to the wayside. And isn't that interesting? Because in general, the public tends to have a lot more um, controversy, a lot more anger about sex trafficking. There are many people who feel as though prostitution, if it is consensual, should not even be a crime. Do you think, first I want to start, Matt, by asking, do you think that the prosecutor, when they came forward and talked about it as being this sex trafficking ring, do you think that they were trying to uh, work with the public's opinion on that and sort of take advantage of that to get people a little bit more worked up than they might have been if they just thought it was straightforward prostitution. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, certainly uh, there, there is the concern. You're, you're talking about, um, you know, individuals uh, who uh, may be uh, legal or illegal um, uh, aliens uh, in, in the country. In this case, I don't think that there's any suggestion that any of these uh, sex workers uh, were in fact illegal, but um, you know the issue becomes uh, you know more of uh, you know are we going to attack the sensational aspect mm -hmm. of this? Hey, this is much more than just a, a prostitution ring. You know this is a, this is a, a human trafficking ring, and that really uh, you know sets a whole different framework for how this case is perceived. Right. And the know, other thing away from that, the now, other and, and, and it's taken on a different uh, uh, sort of feeling to it. Yeah, the other thing that sort of sets a different framework, and I've had to deal with it in a few cases, and it's hard, is this particular woman needed an interpreter. So everything the judge said, and it was a phone interpreter, it wasn't someone in the room, at least it appeared that way to me. So everything that the judge said then had to be interpreted through the person on the phone to the defendant. Doesn't that make cases a whole lot more difficult to try, especially in front of a jury, if everything needs to be interpreted to the witness and then back to the, the attorney and to the jury? Well, yeah, it certainly complicates matters. And it, and it also leaves open, you know, especially when you don't have an interpreter, you know, in the room. And I would assume at, at, at a trial in this case, or even a, a, a plea, there would be a, an in-person um, interpreter. You know, I have in the past used uh, telephone interpreters as a member of the Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole. And oftentimes what you find is that, is that the interpreter uh, is doing more than just interpreting word for word, yeah. but kind of putting their own slant on it. Yeah. And, it and it makes it a, a bit difficult to, to, to challenge that when you're doing it by telephone. Yeah, it's. I think it's difficult. It, it's. Uh, we could do a whole segment just on interpretation at court because, to your point, by phone is difficult. You don't know. I don't know Chinese. I don't know. And that was my, in my case, that was the interpreter. And then on top of that, it sort of loses its bang when you're trying to cross-examine somebody. Well, we'll keep an eye on this. We'll certainly be covering any more hearings if there are any 
in this case. And we will be taking a quick break. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about the sentencing of Chanel Lewis, who was charged with and, and convicted of the murder of Karina Vetrano. So stay tuned. Wow. I want to bring in Matt and talk a little bit about that very compelling testimony and, and entreaty, you know, plea to the judge to put this man behind bars for life. Matt, in situations like this, you're a criminal defense attorney. How do you deal with and counter the emotion involved in that type of a statement? Well, it's difficult. Um, you know, obviously, uh, this is very powerful testimony. Uh, victim impact testimony is always powerful uh, at the time of sentencing. Uh, you know, as a member of the victim's family, you know, we this individual, the, uh, the victim's father, can go far beyond what might be permitted uh, during the course of a trial. Uh, you know, the, the rules of evidence are very relaxed at, at sentencing. And, um, you know, a defense attorney has to so, show compassion as well uh, for the victim's uh, family. You know, we the victim is dead. Yeah. Um, and, and so you have to be compassionate with that family um, and, and those family members who uh, are living in great pain with the loss of a loved one. Yeah, it's, you know, there's, there's not much to say to counter that. I, I thought it was interesting. Have you ever heard of the lizard brain theory of trying cases? It's a, it's a theory that many plaintiff's attorneys have where they call upon the jury or the judge to protect the public and to save us from, you know, those things that might be out there to kill us. And it sounded like he was almost doing that when he said, you need to protect the people and use your power to protect the people. I, I don't believe that this father knew about the lizard brain theory, but it certainly is an effective way to call upon the judge to say, you were elected by the people to protect us and do your job. Do you think that that has impact on a judge when they're looking to set a sentence? Well, I, you know, I think what has impact on the judge is, is testimony about how uh, this this brutal killing affected this family, not just, you know, immediately after their loved one's death, but how this ongoing uh, pain has affected their family and affected their life. You know, as it's called, an impact statement. What impact? has this crime and loss of their loved one had on their day-to-day -day lives uh, since this crime was committed. And I think that's what really compelling uh, to a judge. Uh, the judge certainly knows uh, what his responsibility is and takes that responsibility very seriously. But but to, to, to really feel uh, the, the pain, feel empathy for the family, I think that's what drives uh, a judge in a situation like this. Well, I, and I agree, and we're going to hear something that may have me made him feel even more empathy. I want to bring in Matt to talk about that statement from the defense attorney. Matt, those types of statements are the types of things that you do all the time. As you're making this statement, how are you feeling if you're her that your chances are? Well, you know, you have to zealously represent your client, uh, regardless of the circumstances, and I, I give her credit. Uh, for doing that, um, you know, she talked about preparing a sentence memorandum, which is important, which is kind of uh, the defense's uh, version of a pre-sentence report. It's kind of it's an outline of the defendant's life, uh, you know, that, that can, contains information about uh, certain mitigating circumstances that the court should consider. Um, you know, she's arguing for, you know, some sort of a leniency here by the court. Uh, you know, we, we've heard uh, from uh, the victim's parents, and there's no way that you can counter that kind of gut-wrenching um, testimony. You know, she did acknowledge the loss, and I think that was appropriate, uh, but she only has, you know, a limited amount of things to work with here, and, and she's doing the best that she can to present it to the court. Yeah, and, uh, you know, she was very effective, as you pointed out. I mean, she had her list of facts, her list of issues, her conversations with the parents, the fact that they've been there to support. Are there any of those types of situations where the judge is so struck by that type of a presentation by the defense attorney that they reduce the sentence? It seems to me in a case like this, she really didn't have a chance. She had to do it for her client, as you pointed out. But are there ever th those situations in a crime as heinous as this where the judge does reduce the sentence? Well, you know, the heinousness of this crime, you know, really makes it difficult for the court. Uh, but certainly, I think there are opportunities 
uh, when there's significant mitigation uh, that that you can influence a judge's decision while he or she is sitting there right on the bench. Um, you know, and I'm talking about mitigation like a history of abuse or mental health problems, um, you know, things like that that really go to the core uh, uh, of culpability or, or the extent of culpability in, in a particular uh, case. So, yeah, I think there are times where, where that type of statement, a, a pretrial mem memorandum can be effective. Uh, but in this case, it's tough. Yeah, it's really tough. We did hear from the defendant. He said that all he wanted to say is that he's sorry for the family's loss, but he is innocent. You know, we hear that a lot of times from defendants. But in this case, it's especially interesting. The first jury in this case was hung. They didn't, they didn't feel as though the DNA evidence was strong enough, and they felt as though the confession by the defendant was coerced. This jury only deliberated, I think it was around five hours, but a juror came forward, Matt, and stated that during the deliberations, he was coerced. He felt as though the judge was biased towards the family because he wore purple, which he knew was the victim's favorite color. He said that the foreman had already made up his mind, that the jurors were talking about the case before they were do began all of their deliberations. And in fact, the judge actually held a hearing where he interviewed the jurors. All of this is rather unusual, isn't it? Well, it, it certainly is. I mean, the, the fundamental uh, aspect uh, of our constitutional rights is, is the entitlement to a fair trial. And the court's always going to be guarded with regard to that issue of a fair trial. You know, so here we have a juror who says that, that the jury foreman uh, made up his mind before the trial was over, um, that the jurors dis discussed the case uh, during the trial. You know, the judge will frequently admonish jurors not to discuss the case during the trial and certainly not to make up your mind until you've heard all the evidence in the case. Um, but obviously the court you know, listen to this uh, testimony from some jurors, uh, listen to arguments from the court, and has denied this, uh, you know, motion uh, for a new trial based on uh, some juror misconduct. Yeah, it's, it, that, that's correct. And he did so without giving any reasons why, just simply said that the motion was denied. Now, that's all well and good, but it is certainly going to be the basis of an appeal by the defense, don't you think? No question. There, there are going to be appeals. And, you know, as um, you know, the, the viewers know, I mean, every time you hear an objection at, at, at trial, it's laying the groundwork uh, for a possible uh, appeal. Uh, and, and so there, th this juror issue is going to come up. Um, you know, the other issues with regard to the uh, DNA contamination and the admissibility of that evidence and the coercion of a, uh, of a, uh, a confession are all issues that are going to be brought up on appeal. You know, uh, and it'll be years before we know the result of, of those appeals. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this defendant isn't going anywhere until um, those issues are resolved. He is not going anywhere. We are going to take a quick break, ladies and gentlemen. When we come back, we'll be talking about the McStay family murder, so stay tuned with us.